Hello, everyone, and welcome to another uh, edition of our Evo Eco seminar series. Uh, before I introduce today's speaker, I'm sorry, I should introduce myself. My name is Raoul von Bell. I'm a postdoc for Judith Bank here at UBC. And I'd like to start with some general housekeeping. Um, so for starters, the next talk will be on Friday, which will be Stephen Stearns. And he'll be talking about evolution of aging and chronic disease. Um, we probably have some new viewers today. And so just a reminder that we have Q&A at the end of this talk, um, which will be organized through Slack. And there's also the link to this uh, Slack in the description of this video. And if you've not caught many of our other talks, um, just a reminder that many of them are still available on our YouTube channel. And so you can just watch them back. And with that, I'd like to introduce today's speaker, uh, who is Dr. Pontus Koplund. Pontus did his PhD in Uppsala with Matthias Jakobson. He then did a postdoc with David Wright at Harvard. And he's currently a group leader at the Francis Crick Institute. The work of Pontus is defined by his use of ancient DNA in computational genomics. In particular, his work focuses on understanding the evolutionary story of humans. But as you'll see today, he also frequently studies men's best friend. And with that, I'd like to um, ask you to start with Pontus. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Ruth, and all the organizers for this invitation and, and such a great initiative. Uh, it's really fun to be here and, and sort of talk in the ecology and evolution community. We work a lot with human uh, genetics and human um, evolution and evolutionary history, but it's really great opportunity to talk about uh, one thing we're really interested in in the lab, which is uh, the origin of dogs uh, and evolution of uh, wolves and their association uh, with humans. Uh, and so behind my a little bit grandiose uh, title, I won't talk so much about human population history, only some of the explicit comparative population genetics we're trying to do uh, to ask questions about whether particular dog uh, groups uh, were tightly associated with particular prehistoric human groups. Um, and so the sort of things I hope you will come away with after this talk is um, a little bit about what we know about the first dog, dogs and so spoiler alert i won't be able to tell you where dogs initiated i think we don't know that yet but i'll tell you why i think we don't know that yet and i'll be able to tell you something about i think we're really starting to home in at least on the time uh, when dogs originated um i will talk about this comparative population history of dogs and particular prehistoric human groups uh, as well on, as some of our uh, work that's getting going now on wolf dynamics across uh, 100,000 years, a really exciting data set that's building up uh, of genomes from across this uh, time period. Uh, and so overall, uh, I'll talk about some data we have uh, in the pipeline uh, that we're currently analyzing that actually includes about 100 ancient dog and wolf genomes. Um, and I think canids and wolves and dogs uh, are a really promising model system for evolutionary paleogen paleogenomics, you know, ancient DNA, approaches to understanding evolution. Um, there's a relatively short generation time at least compared to humans, so, you know, maybe two or three years. Uh, there's also a really great fossil record, which has allowed us to build up this um, time series wolf genomes that I'll talk about, which is really longer and more extensive than what's currently available for human, despite all the effort that, that many of us are putting into human uh, ancient genomics. Uh, and there's also this fantastic functional genomics and phenotypic genomics community for dogs, uh, which I think is going to grow a lot, uh, not least by the direct-to-consumer genetics um, uh, initiatives that are available where people can, you know, take a sample from their dog and send it to companies. Uh, it's going to really create this massive data set of understanding the genetics of traits that we might be able to trace through uh, several uh, thousands or tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of years. Um, and so the key that we're working with in, in, in the Ancient Genomics Lab at the Creek is these ancient DNA approaches, um, which you know we think of as really being the only way we can study evolutionary change through time, which is you know, really the definition of evolution is genetic change through time. Uh, and so, with ancient genomes, we can you know we can find those um, uh, those past observations to really see uh, what happened as we uh, temporally. Um, so uh, we use ancient DNA retrieval approaches that I won't go too much into, but includes these clean room approaches uh, and this 
um, uh, protective equipment. Uh, and so right now, uh, we, as well as many other ancient DNA labs, uh, are uh, shut down uh, to manage the current crisis and not using this. Uh, but many of you will be familiar with this sort of um, approaches, although here we're trying to protect the material from us uh, rather than the other way around. Um, and so the first half of my talk, which is um, what we've worked uh, most on so far, um, is a study on the ancient genomic history of dogs. So we sequenced 27 ancient uh, dog genomes, so expanding on the previous five or so that were available, um, uh, mainly from Europe, but also from uh, parts of Eastern Eurasia, uh, up to about 11,000 uh, years old. Uh, um, this was a fantastic collaboration with many archaeologists, uh, as well as particularly two ancient DNA labs, uh, Gregor Larson's lab at Oxford and uh, Ronkin Hasse's lab at uh, University of Vienna. Uh, and all the analyses I'm going to show in principle were uh, made by Anders Bergström, uh, who is a postdoc that I'm very uh, lucky to have uh, in the group. So, um, to start off with some of the hypotheses that have been around about ancient dogs, there has been great work about mainly from modern uh, dog genetics and some ancient DNA. Um, but there's sort of like an, a strong ongoing debate on the origin of dogs. You know, some people say that there were multiple origins. Some people have promoted uh, particular regions like Europe, uh, Central Asia, or East Asia. Um, uh, but it was kind of before we had these ancient genomes, and uh, that, and I think it, it becomes really worth readdressing these questions, uh, which I'll get back to. Um, but so, how could we think of a sort of ideal piece of evidence that would point to a point of origin of dogs or a particular region that gave rise to dogs? Well, in one ideal scenario, perhaps we could see that the ancestry of domestic dogs appeared nested within the ancestry of other dogs, wolves. Well, I'm sorry. Um, for example, as in this scenario, it might have been that domestic dogs are uh, clearly much more related to European wolves than to other wolves, um, and sort of nested within this diversity of wolves. That would provide quite a good origin, um, uh, evidence of an origin in Europe, um, particularly if we also had ancient DNA. Uh, but what has arisen from um, uh, recent uh, genomic studies, uh, studied by Friedman et al, uh, 2014, is that actually domestic dog ancestry when compared to present day wolves um, is basal to all that diversity. So present day wolves, regardless of if they are from China or Europe uh, or anywhere else, are kind of a monophyletic group with respect to dogs. And so that doesn't really tell us then where dogs originated. It must have been some, from some type of extinct wolf population uh, that maybe we can get to uh, with ancient DNA. Um, but we can also ask questions um, about if there were multiple origins, um, for example, um, I, I worked on a study uh, in 2015 where we sequenced the first uh, Ice Age wolf genome, and we found that it was actually basal to this whole clade of present day dogs and wolves. And so there are questions to which extent various ancient wolves might have contributed to present day uh, dog diversity. Uh, and indeed, also, if there were then multiple contributions, perhaps from different domestication centers of the dog. And so, with our extended data of ancient dog genomes, uh, we thought it was a good opportunity to re reassess this uh, evidence. Uh, and so we took this approach based on symmetry statistics. You might also know them as D statistics or ABABA statistics or F4 statistics, as we will use here, um, where we're asking the question of if a pair of dogs are symmetric in their genetics with respect to another wolf. Uh, and we're going to run these tests for over 60 different uh, dog genomes in pairs and over 30 different wolves. Uh, and the rationale of this is that if we can identify a mutation that uh, appears as a derived variant in the wolf, and it's still polymorphic in dogs, we know that it must have arisen before the divergence. Uh, and if there was no gene flow, it follows naturally that um, uh, we expect on average, we would find an equal frequency of this derived variant in any of these two dogs. But if we across the genome, we do a jackknife procedure to test for significant genome-wide evidence. If we across the genome see a significant shift to wolves in some dogs that would provide evidence of gene flow, perhaps even multiple domestications. Uh, and when we do this, so here is a, a different plot for uh, a few different wolves uh, to show us an example uh, where if they conform to the null hypothesis of no gene flow, they should sort of be in the center here, follow this dotted line. 
But as you can see, many of these um, statistics are colored in red because they significantly deviate from zero. Basically, there's a lot of evidence of gene flow between dogs and wolves. However, if um, the gene flow was into dogs, so if, a, if dogs have wolf ancestry, since wolves are monophyletic, we expect any wolf to sort of uh, produce such a signal of affinity to those dogs. Uh, but we do find some wolves that do not show any of these shifts, su suggesting to us uh, that this gene flow must be primarily from dog populations into the wild, into wolf populations. If it was the other way, from wild wolves into dogs, we would expect to see also for wolves such as this wolf from Central Asia, we would see uh, significant shifts, shifts in particular dog populations. Uh, and indeed, uh, we can also look at this QQ plot and see sort of no evidence uh, that we would of deviation from normality uh, across multiple uh, tests. I mean, a parallel, perhaps if people are familiar with uh, the evidence of gene flow from Neanderthals in populations outside of Africa, um, this is a signal where people, for example, in Europe and East Asia are significantly shifted towards Neanderthal. Um, uh, and you can imagine if we would then find a Neanderthal that where we do this test and we don't see the shift that suggests that actually what we had seen previously was just because of gene flow into those particular Neanderthals that were studied before. Um, now, in this in the Neanderthal case, there's several uh, other pieces of evidence that you know makes it uh, impossible to find such a thing, but that's kind of uh, a rationale you can think of here. Um, and so more broadly, this evidence of exclusively dog gene flow into the wild is really contrary to what has been um, uh, discussed for other species using genome-wide data, uh, domestic species such as cattle, horses, pigs, uh, sheep, uh, where wild introgression is believed to be really common. Um, we can't really put an, a limit in percent of how much, I mean, uh, wild introgression there might be. You know, there was certainly a little bit, but it seems to be very little, um, so little as to be undetectable in our analysis. Um, so once we had established that, that all our diverse ancient dogs, you know, had very little evidence of gene flow from the wild, uh, we tried to understand the sort of broader population history by taking this admixture graph approach. Uh, we selected particular ancient dogs that sort of uh, were representative of major ancestries that we could see in the past. Um, and we, uh, for uh, these six different uh, dog lineages that we identified, we tested all possible admixture graphs about 135,000 um, with uh, up to two admixture edges. Um, I can answer questions about uh, admixture graphs if this is unfamiliar to many people, but it's basically what you see. We try to model splits between population lineages uh, and punctual admixture events, not taking into account more contiguous gene flow. Um, the pattern is really interesting. For example, um, uh, the best graph that we found, even though we found one that was um, you know, we could reject, but you know, it wasn't so much worse than the main graph. Uh, is that it rec recapitulates many things about human history? For example, uh, that uh, also in humans uh, there appears to be uh, an admixture between Near Eastern or Levantine lineages that come in uh, with agriculture in Europe uh, and the previous populations that were there. Which uh, in dogs, the best representative of we have is this eleven thousand year old um, dog from. Uh, Karelia, so uh, northwestern Russia. Um, but my main takeaway from this graph that you might think of is that um, given its structure, we could be quite sure that actually um, by 11,000 years so ago, there would already have been five major dog ancestries diversified, uh, which also then corresponds to the Pleistocene Holocene uh, boundary. So, um, common sort of thing to say with based on the archaeological record is that you know dogs were the first domesticate There's really strong evidence of that in the archaeological record um, perhaps the you know the other ones perhaps cattle were or someone else were second about about 10,000 years ago uh, but already by that time there were several different dog uh, ancestries suggesting that domestication happened quite a few thousand uh, years earlier than that uh, and indeed as I will get back to a little bit uh, much of these major ancestries that already must have existed by 11,000 years ago still has left some ancestry in present day dogs uh, around the world, which is quite fascinating. Um, so getting back to this admixture in Europe, um, getting into a little bit more um, detailed population genetics territory, uh, we tried an approach where we look at shared genetic drift with different ancient ancestries. 
using uh, the outgroup F3 uh, approach. So on the y-axis, uh, we plot shared genetic drift with uh, an ancient Siberian dog, uh, and on the x-axis, with shared genetic drift with a 7,000-year-old uh, dog from the Levant. Um, and what was really striking to us is that uh, ancient West Eurasian dogs, mostly European dogs, really fall on sort of a linear climb between these two. Um, and such a pattern is really only expected to show up under admixture. So here are a few coalescent simulations to sort of demonstrate this. If you just have a tree-like structure um, like this, you don't expect a, a line along the diagonal. You expect more of a V pattern because um, the intermediate populations uh, don't show this really strictly intermediate ancestry. Uh, also, continuous gene flow cannot really rep uh, recapitulate this pattern. Uh, but a major admixture event where all populations are on this kind of ancestry decline, really, if they are 30 to 70 percent ancestry or 50 to 50 percent ancestry, uh, is what you can do to recapitulate this. Um, so we think this is likely due to the agricultural expansion in Europe, uh, where perhaps agricultural dogs uh, would admix with the previous hunter-gatherer dogs that were in Europe, and there, this has already been suggested in the mitochondrial ancient DNA um, uh, literature as well. Um, but the other thing um, that is really striking is that modern European dogs seen within from this point of diversity um, are really homogenous in ancestry. So all of this diversity that was there 5,000 years ago, up to 10,000 years ago, um, was basically erased uh, and homogenized into the modern European dog breeds uh, that you see today, such that a uh, 5,000 year old dog from Greece uh, is not more closely related to any present day dog compared to other ancient dogs. Um, so what we think happened was that um, maybe 10,000 or 7,000 years ago, there was this agricultural expansion into Europe. But after 4,000 years ago, at some point, we don't know exactly what happened. Future ancient DNA studies have to find out. Uh, there was an expansion of a, some type of ancestry across Europe that really homogenized uh, the dog ancestry there and formed a diversity of uh, most present day modern European breeds. Um, and so the next thing we try to do is instead of sort of thinking about many parallels between human and dog histories, how can we do this a little bit more formalized? Can we do comparative population history where we compare uh, human population history to dog population history to identify um, differences? Uh, and so we first do a principal component analysis on uh, ancient dog population. Um, uh, so as you can see here, we see some geographic patterns as well uh, with Siberian dogs over sort of in this end of the V-shaped cline and then going around uh, Levantine dogs on the other end here. And what we did then is do also a PCA on variation from ancient humans that we had matched exactly with uh, those ancient dogs to be from identical sort of places in time and archaeological context. Uh, and then we do a trick called Procrustes transformation to kind of twist uh, those two configurations to be as close to each other as possible. And then we want to see, you know, how well does dog and human population structure correspond to each other. Uh, and as you can see from this uh, figure, there's the general features correspond quite well. Um, the broad features of east-west division between dogs and humans uh, really match up. Uh, but if we look at the residuals, we can sort of find some, some uh, differences as well. Uh, for example, um, the most uh, differentiated ones include uh, step Bronze Age dogs and humans, um, which I will get back to a little bit later, uh, but could, uh, we think it's due to differential impact of um, steppe expansions that happened from about four and a half thousand years ago into both Europe and East Asia. And in this case of Europe, which is included in this uh, PCA, um, we don't see a persistent shift in ancestry from the steppe expansion, which is in contrast to what is seen in humans in some uh, classic studies by Hakital and Rasmussen et al. 2015. Um, so trying to formalize this a little bit more than looking at this model-free approach with PCA, uh, we uh, used QPDM ancestry modeling, which we can also talk about during questions if necessary, you can see these citations. Uh, but basically we, we uh, use this set of ancestry sources that you see in this box uh, and we ask, okay, you know, how can we most parsimoniously explain the ancestry of a set of present-day uh, dogs? Um, and some really interesting features appear. For example, um, we see um, 
affinities to a step dog we have in East Asia, as opposed to what we don't see in Europe, as I mentioned before. So substantial amounts of um, shared uh, relatedness between the step dog that we have in our data and uh, Chinese dogs today. Uh, could very likely be due to uh, the migrations from the steppe that also occurred into East Asia um, about four and uh, five thousand years ago. Uh, but in humans, while they are very apparent in ancient DNA record, they didn't leave uh, so much ancestry in later generations, and that seems to be a difference uh, in dog uh, populations. Um, we also see evidence of ancestry related to our 7,000-year-old uh, Lake Baikal Siberian dogs in some north, other northeast Siberian dog breeds, breeds husky-type dogs. Um, in the Near East, we see that African dogs um, really show the closest link to a 7,000-year-old uh, Levant dog in our data set, the only present-day dogs, or indeed actually ancient dogs, that have a, such a strong link to that individual, suggesting a close link between African dogs and Near Eastern dogs uh, in the past. Um, however, present-day Near East dog ancestry uh, doesn't seem to have much of that original Levantine uh, dog ancestry. Uh, but instead have ancestry from a dog uh, genome we uh, have from ancient Iran. Um, what's also fascinating to me is that um, there's some of this you know, original dog ancestry present in breeds that may be familiar to some people. For example, we see some evidence of uh, ancient um, uh, or original African dog ancestry in the Rhodesian Ridgeback, which people are very familiar with, um, some evidence of ancient American dog ancestry in uh, breeds such as the Chihuahua and the Sherlock Squintly, the Mexican hairless dog, um, as well as, of course, uh, some uh, evidence of ancestry related to in indigenous Oceanian dogs in uh, dingo and um, other uh, Australian dogs. Um, so I won't talk too much about selection, but I wanted to mention this one thing which people have been really interested in, in uh, with dogs, which is an expansion in copy number um, in the AMI2B gene, which uh, encodes pancreatic amylase. Um, uh, and what's re what we see in the ancient time series is that uh, hunter-gatherer dogs co colored in blue here seem to retain a quite low copy number uh, of this uh, gene, which has been um, you know, linked to starch digestion, so thought to be really important uh, for agriculturalists. So these hunter-gatherers seem to retain sort of quite, hunter-gatherer dogs seem to retain quite low copy, no copy numbers. Um, whereas in other dogs, including those associated with agriculturalists. In some of them it's high, in some of them it's variable, uh, and already some of the earliest ones, including a 7,000-year-old Levantine dog, has really not so um, uh, expanded copy numbers, suggesting that it was a process that might have been um, uh, uh, really getting going a bit later than the first uh, agriculturalists. Um, so switching to the sort of second part of my talk, when we're gonna talk a little bit more about gray wolves, um, but uh, actually, the question that I mentioned first, which is about the first dogs, like, you know, where did they come from? When did domestication happen? It's really a question about wolves. Uh, it's going to be hard to answer by getting uh, early dog genomes. Perhaps if we can find the, the wolf source population of dogs, that's the sort of uh, most promising population genetic approach. Uh, but there are also questions about wolves themselves. For example, uh, many will be familiar with um, the megafaunal extinctions that happened around the time of the last glacial maximum, 20,000 years ago, uh, including uh, of charismatic species like the woolly mammoth, the woolly rhinoceros, uh, cave lions, saber-toothed tigers, cave hyenas, cave bears. Uh, but gray wolves are still around, right? You know, in this um, plot here of um, historical and, and uh, present-day distributions, uh, gray wolves are really quite successful species uh, seen in their the range and they're still around. So why did that happen? Why did they not go through extinctions? Uh, well, it's gonna turn out that actually they probably went through extinctions uh, of some particular gray wolf populations, whereas others might have uh, filled the niche or uh, the areas where the previous uh, ones existed. Uh, so in this uh, very related study where, uh, again, Anders Bergström has, has done all the analysis I'm gonna show here, and we worked with a really large consortium, uh, including the Natural History Museum in Stockholm, uh, the Max Planck in Jena and Tübingen, uh, University of Potsdam, uh, Oxford, and University of Copenhagen. Um, to collect this data, it's really a group effort of 75 uh, ancient whole genomes of about median coverage 1x uh, from uh, ancient wolves. 
Um, this includes that some of you may have seen in the media, this kind of really amazing 40,000 year old wolf head um, that um, Lube Dalian's group at uh, Dave Stanton at the Natural History Museum in Stockholm extracted the DNA from and turns out to be a really uh, well-preserved specimen, perhaps uh, unsurprisingly. Um, and so if we just do a naive clustering approach using the program admixture, um, we find that the ancient wolves, you know, get their own sort of cluster uh, compared to present day wolves. Uh, but that doesn't always tell us that, you know, this is actually a phylogenetic phenomenon that they were um, uh, basal or a monophyletic group that was basal and, and sort of were replaced by later wolves. Uh, so we again try to adopt this admixture graph framework to ask this question. Um, but one thing that turns out to be really complicated when you work with um, ancient DNA overall, and particularly when you work with non-model species perhaps, uh, is reference bias. So in the case of canids, uh, the dog reference genome is of a boxer. Um, and when we compare uh, you know, the affinity of an ancient genome uh, to the reference genome uh, compared to some other boxer genome, uh, we see a significant shift towards the reference genome. Uh, and this can play um, uh, tricks with our analysis in many cases. So uh, we did this approach where we always model sort of fake admixture from the reference genome um, into, all of, uh, into the ancient genome that we plug into the analysis. Uh, and we asked the question, well, our ancient genome, does it fit as being on the modern wolf lineage, on the modern dog genome, uh, modern dog lineage, or does it fit as being an outgroup to modern dogs and wolves? And so uh, this figure then shows time or the date of the ancient genome on the x-axis up to 100,000 year old genomes, uh, which we were lucky to obtain. Um, and each genome is colored by their assignment along this graph. Uh, and on the y-axis, um, I show the genome coverage just to show the sort of some of the uncertainty that goes, may go into this analysis for some of the lower coverage genomes. And so what you can see is that there are only red dots up until about the last glacial maximum 25,000 or so years ago, uh, where some of the genomes we have cannot be confidently assigned to either lineage. Uh, but after that period, we start to see blue dots which can be confidently assigned as being phylogenetically on the modern wolf lineage, uh, suggesting that it arrived perhaps around that time period. But before that, all the red dots suggest that these were wolves that were really an outgroup to both modern wolves and dogs. Um, and when we look at this uh, a little bit more closer though, uh, we can see that despite there being this likely replacement, uh, some of the affinity of particular regional ice age wolves remain in the data. So here, uh, the x-axis is still time, but the y-axis is now one of these D statistics, uh, or four statistics, looking for asymmetry to a 30,000-year-old Siberian wolf versus a 30,000-year-old European wolf. Um, and uh, sort of, once you look a bit more closely at this, we can see that uh, there's still some separation between later wolves, so that um, later wolves uh, for some time uh, retain, in Europe, retain an affinity to the really, the, to the pre-LGM, pre-last glacial maximum uh, wolves that were there. Uh, but overall, it seems to be some type of turnover that gave rise to the modern wolf lineage um, after the last glacial maximum. Uh, but there may very well have been turnovers also before that. We see evidence of, you know, 50,000 year old wolves uh, largely being replaced by 30,000 year old wolves. Um, this might be sort of a little bit of an issue with a mixture graph models. Uh, you could imagine that there being a sort of a long-standing interconnectivity between these uh, regions over these many thousands of years that also give rise to these patterns. Um, but one thing that's interesting about Ice Age wolves is that it seems that the, some of them may have contributed part of the ancestry of present-day dogs, uh, which is something we found evidence of already in 2015 in a uh, preliminary uh, paper we did on a single ancient wolf genome that was 35,000 years old. Uh, and this was evidence of some ancestry of a few percent in present day husky type dogs like the Siberian Husky that may trace uh, back to this uh, 35,000 Ice Age uh, uh, wolves uh, in Siberia at the time. Um, we're also really keen to uh, study things like natural selection uh, uh, using these types of data. And so one of the preliminary things uh, we've been looking at is if, for example, if there's evidence of adaptive integration with this ice age to husky type dog uh, integration. 
Uh, and so when we plot an instant regression statistic on the x-axis against a selection statistic on the y-axis, all these are all F statistics, by the way, um, so the top candidate in both of these analyses is a gene called KRT9, which is one that's you know, quite fun to make a story about, possibly, uh, because in humans, uh, people that have particular mutations that uh, impact this gene get something called palmoplantar keratoderma, sort of a real hardening of their, uh, um, uh, of sort of uh, the equivalent of foot pads in dogs, which you could imagine is, is a really uh, uh, nice adaptation to have if you're a sled dog in, in Siberia. Uh, and this is work with uh, Mikkel Sinding and Shyam Gopalakrishnan and Tom Gilbert that was in Copenhagen that have also confirmed this uh, using uh, additional ancient uh, or uh, recent Siberian dog data they have. So uh, overall, we're uh, also really keen into understanding things like um, over this 100,000 year old time series, can we find evidence of selective sweeps uh, and other things that might be important to the ecological adaptation of these wolves um, and, and something really uh, interested in looking forward to in the future as well. Um, and so with that, I already thanked a great set of collaborators on these two different projects. Uh, and I also like to thank uh, the lab at the Creek, uh, where we also work with human Asian DNA. And uh, feel free to contact us if you have any questions or want to work with us on uh, ancient dogs or ancient wolves or ancient humans for that matter. Thank you very much. Thanks, Pontus. That was great. Sorry, I need to change. I'll start with a question. Um, so do you think it's surprising that there's so little gene flow from wolves into dogs? Well, it surprised me in the beginning because there's been so much talk about it. Uh, I mean, we were really trying to sort of see if something could be wrong. I mean, there might be a, a little bit of a power issue that we were worried about. For example, you know, dog ancestry is more recognizable because dogs have this kind of bottleneck when they during domestication. Uh, but we don't really think it can explain the broad patterns we see. And I mean, maybe if you think about it again, um, you know, um, if you've had dogs, you know, it, you know, it, it might be easier for them to sort of escape into the wild uh, than, uh, you know, to sort of uh, for wolves to be incorporated in, in among human groups. Uh, That's sort of my very amateur anthropology uh, sort of thoughts about that. And many people who, who think about this uh, uh, deeply as well. For sure. So uh, a question from one of the viewers. I guess it's challenging to genotype copy number variation in ancient genomes because of high sequence similarity between homologs. Uh, how did you overcome this issue? Yeah, so we, in this case, it's quite a long region. Uh, I don't remember the exact number, but it's, it's quite a substantial region. So we look at the coverage over this uh, region and we uh, normalize it by the coverage over a similar uh, region uh, elsewhere. And if we go back to the slide, I guess, um, let's see. Um, as you can see, we get quite sort of confident calls for uh, present day wolves and other canids. Uh, modern dogs have this expansion, even though, you know, they're variable as well. Uh, so we're sort of fairly confident that this fits into um, sort of the broad patterns, even though we're not sure about sort of the exact copy number. Uh, we think the broad patterns of the sort of the ones that have a really evidence of a substantial expansion, perhaps even sort of a tenfold expansion, uh, those patterns we should be roughly approximating. Mm -hmm. So another question, um, but you could talk a bit more about dog breed diversification in relation to population history. So yes, dog breed and um, diversity, I can go back to this one. Um, so it was surprising to us, I guess, that, you know, even though we know about the, you know, the most dog breeds uh, originating just in the sort of past few hundred years, uh, you know, in many places, including Victoria in England, uh, were really important in this and mainland Europe. Um, it was surprising in many ways that, you know, you could have imagined that the village dogs, village type dogs that were around really contributed to this diversity. It's really not to see, you know, like an Irish ancient 7,000 year old dog that we analyze does not seem to contribute to the breeds that are from, you know, the British Isles more than a dog from Greece, as I mentioned. Um, so, I mean, it will be something that certainly will be interesting to study in more detail, 
we were mostly focusing on uh, four to 10,000 years ago in, in, in this study. So for, to understand that, we're going to have to look at the past 4,000 years and even the past few hundred years. Yeah, so I guess modern dog breeds that we sort of know are much younger, right? Um, well, the European ones are sort of believed to be just a few hundred years old. Um, mm -hmm. Certainly there's evidence of continuity. I mentioned, you know, we have these 7,000 year old uh, Siberian dogs from Lake Baikal that show an affinity to, for example, the Siberian Husky. Uh, so there's definitely some evidence of continuity there, uh, you know, over several thousand of years. And there's basically all of those five major dog lineages that we can see uh, and that we can see were there at about 11,000 years ago, contribute some part of dog ancestry today, even though some, in some cases it's only a few percent. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned reference bias because the dog reference is from a boxer. Uh, are there any efforts underway to minimize this reference bias? For example, uh, ancestral straight reconstruction for SNPs and things like that. Yes, and I mean, you know, the, um, we can use reference graphs are sort of a very promising approach. If we can build a map of the polymorphisms that are, you know, that we expect to see uh, in dogs, it's probably possible for a hundred thousand year old wolves, it's a bit more difficult. Uh, so that's a promising thing to do. I mean, it's it's really a, a, a challenging problem in ancient DNA. So in the dog case for our study, it was less of a problem because the ancient dogs are kind of closer to the boxer, whereas the wolves are, you know, they separated up to 30,000 generations from the boxer genome. And so then it becomes much more of an issue. Um, there are a lot of things that you can think about there, masking variants, for example, or using an outgroup instead. Um, I actually think it's better in this case that we use this boxer setup as opposed to using an outgroup, we could, for example, imagine using a coyote reference genome, because with the boxer setup, you know, we can sort of uh, constrain the reference bias by contrasting the exact reference genome from other boxers uh, and sort of um, treat it as a nuisance variant, um, a nuisance parameter in, in this admixture graph framework and sort of model it out. Mm -hmm. So do you have any information about specific genome regions or types of genes for which variation was lost during the spread around 4,000 years ago? Um, no, uh, we haven't really gotten that far, actually. I don't think I can say anything like that. <laughs> uh, but that would certainly be interesting. I mean, at the same time, there's a question then, you know, the phenotypic variation, we, phenotypic, uh, the trait genetics we know about dogs will mostly be based on genome-wide association studies in modern breeds. Uh, and the problem is that they don't capture all the diversity that was there before, so it's going to be a little bit hard to reconstruct, you know, for example, estimate what the size of some ancient dog was, um, even though that's certainly something that would be really cool to try to um, do. And of course, if we find novel variants, uh, we might be able to predict their phenotypic impact to some extent as well. Mm -hmm. So can you say anything about selection signatures in early dog domestication compared to what we see in modern day dog breeding? I guess that's related. Yeah, so, I mean, there has been studies looking at this for selective sweeps, you know, the fine dogs. Um, and we're really interested in, in using this data set to do that too. Perhaps even more so than the ancient dogs, it might be useful to get, you know, a snapshot of the wolf variation, you know, 20,000 years ago as a sort of backdrop to that. Uh, a, tree, a problem is that there's a lot of genetic drift associated with the domestication. So, you know, it might be equivalent to an FST of you know, 0.1, 10%. Um, so it becomes hard to separate genetic drift from selection in such, during such an event. Uh, but it's really something we're interested in. in and ho I hope uh, if I give a talk in the future, we'll be able to readdress something about that. Thank you. Um, in the ancestry map with pie charts, there was a pink color for an America genome that only showed up in a few locations, uh, two times in Alaska and once in Greenland. Uh, where was that American genome found? Um, so that American genome, it's mostly, if I recall correctly, it's mostly based on a 2000 year old genome from another publication um, uh, sequenced by the Oxford group, uh, Greg Larson's group. Uh, it's, it's 2000 years ago, it's from Canada. I, I believe it's from uh, Newfoundland or very close to there. Mm -hmm. uh, and so yes, but you know, there's evidence that this was, you know, representative of the pre-Columbian dog variation. You know, it's also evidence from that from mitochondria that are available for a few more ancient American dogs. It's a really fascinating question because, of course, you can see here that other pie, the pie charts in the Americas today 
uh, are really dominated by European ancestry, uh, which likely is a Colombian exchange effect where um, uh, uh, European colonists brought their dogs with them and for uh, you know, many possible reasons, including infectious disease, perhaps even targeted sort of um, extermination of local dog breeds, uh, much of the ancestry that was there, you know, extremely diverse ancestry, probably millions of dogs even in the Americas um, um, that left some portion around today. Mm -hmm. So were there any bottleneck events in the wolf lineages or with different wolf populations, especially at the Ice Age? Um, possibly it's a little bit hard for us to uh, get to given that we mostly have low coverage data from ancient wolves, but it's something we can hopefully address at some point. Um, so for now, it seems that mostly the, um, there was a bottleneck associated with present day wolves. So uh, estimates of affected population sites over time suggest that it was quite high during the ice age, uh, but this much sort of effective population size is much smaller today for uh, whatever reason. Mm -hmm. So someone asked whether you could uh, say a few words about your methods for fitting all the admixture graph permutations. Um, sure. Um, so let's go to that one. Just to... So yeah, we use this uh, fantastic R package from Thomas Mylund's uh, group in Aarhus called, uh, so it's an R package called admixture graph. Um, and so uh, with it, you can obtain all uh, possible admixture graphs for, I believe, six taxa and two admixture events. Um, and then sometimes we then add, uh, we then add uh, sort of the outgroup uh, after uh, doing all those permutations. Um, so that is, it's just, uh, just the, this nice uh, R package. So with regard to the work on adaptive introgression, is there any evidence that huskies have a different food pad phenotype than other dogs? Um, I, I'm not aware of any systematic studies on that actually, but that's a very good question. Uh, it would be interesting to see if there's maybe, you know, you could imagine actually future trait genetics uh, looking into that as well. Yeah, it would be a nice confirmation of that hypothesis. Um, can the four and a half thousand year ago event be due to the spread of Proto-Indo-Europeans? Well, that was really one of the things we were trying to look at. Okay, so to go a little bit more into detail on that question, um, let's see. Um, so, okay, we don't I don't have the pie chart for that now. Uh, we do have a step dog for the experts. It's related to the Shrubnaya um, human culture. Um, it's not ideal, but it's still, an example where the human genomes really have a strong step signature. And so we do find that the early corded wear dog that we have available to us actually from a previous study by Boutique et al. So that early uh, corded wear dog actually seems to have uh, almost half of its ancestry from the step. But after that, we have a few other Bronze Age dogs. We don't really see a lasting uh, impact of, of that. Uh, even though we can also not exclude that it that was the, uh, uh, that was the reason for, for that homogenization, the sort of step expansion um, in the second millennium BC. Uh, so it's something we're really trying to figure out. It doesn't seem to be that, but it may be if, uh, if it's sort of a more complicated uh, ancestry transformation than humans, maybe that is, could, could be uh, the catalyst after all. Thanks so much, Pontus. I'll, uh, I'll seize the questioning for now. Um, uh, Pontus has agreed that he'll uh, take a look at the Slack later on. So if you still have questions left, feel free to just uh, keep posting them and Pontus can come back to them later. Um, for that, uh, for now, I just want to remind you of our schedule for Friday. So Friday we have Stephen Stearns, like I said before, um, and he'll be talking about the evolution of aging and disease. And uh, that, I'd like to thank Pontus again and every one of you for tuning in. And I hope to see you all on Friday. Thank you, everyone.